Today on The Dead Life, we're hearing part two of master numerologist Sue Frederick's interview from last week, and as a special treat, an introduction to emergency room physician Dr. Jeff O'Driscoll's interview. You're going to hear part of that today, and you can hear the rest of it next week. I met both of them at a recent Helping Parents Heal conference, and I think both of them have a lot to offer you. So um, with the nine year, what's important for us to know going into it? Would you have any tips for people or anybody that it will be harder for going into it? Yeah. Are there any numbers that are just going to get buried in that nine year? (laughs) You know, here's my cautionary tale about 2025 is that because we're going to be universally under the vibration of nine, we have to look very closely at our attachments. Mm -hmm. So... If I'm attached to a certain job or a certain uh, even relationship or home, you know, I have to be able to rise above that and think I'm going to be fine because I'm a soul on a journey and I don't need all these things I identify myself with. Mm -hmm. And that attachment works against the energy of the nine. So what I would say, and and I just had to experience this myself, Allison, because last spring I had a a possible exit point and I had a a colon cancer diagnosis and my husband Paul had died of colon cancer. So that was quite an intense little karma for me. And in the process of it, when I was getting my diagnosis and learning that it was what I had, the number of my hospital room was the number nine. And when I first looked at that, I went, oh, no, that means I'm going to die. <laughs> I'd do the same thing. I'd be like, I'm out of here. I'm so right, out of here. Right. <laughs> but then, you know, as I felt into it more and just kind of asked what that lesson was, it was like, no, Sue, surrender your attachment to who you are, the trauma you've been through, your whole story, and let this unfold as it's meant to. And that message came through even from Paul and my departed father, like, just let go of your ideas, your story, your thinking that you've got to be healthy until you die, because I'd always tell myself, you know, I'm just going to go out quick, and I'm going to be healthy until then. Can I um, I ask you about that nine on your door? Um, is nine, would it carry the energy of Sagittarius? Is that what the nine, or is it totally different in numerology and it doesn't really cross over to astrology energy? Well, it does in some ways, but the, you know, the nine I would put more as something I feel, when I feel into the nine, the nine is higher wisdom and surrender attachment. And it brings me right to the Pisces energy when the Pisces is all connected to the divine. Okay. And a lot of Pisces people have trouble being here on earth. They're very, very focused in a different way, in a different world. And well, they're you know, not, they're we, not used to borders and boundaries. <laughs> they have to right, create their right, own. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so that's why you guys group together. That's why they look for their school of fish. They're like, I don't have any borders and boundaries. I need my brothers and my sisters, you know, to help me navigate those. So I was, I was wondering if the nine would carry Sag energy and I was just spitballing this, but it was, um, if the other side was telling you to fight because Sagittarius Mm -hmm. will, I know it's philosophy and, and loves animals and all of that, but it can also be fighter energy. And so I didn't know if maybe you were given a little bit of a heads up to be ready for a battle, one that you can win. And I'm just glad that you won it. Well, the thing is, it turned out to be a miracle, Allison, because, you know, Paul had always told me in spirit that I would never get colon cancer because I was so traumatized from watching him yeah. suffer. Yeah. And so when I had talked to him and said, you know, hey, um, can we make a deal that I never get colon cancer because I just don't want to go out with that same kind of trauma? Yeah. And and he had made that promise to me. So when I was diagnosed, that nine was saying, 
you know, don't go down the dark story that your mind wants to create about this. And then I had a few days, I had about 10 days between diagnosis and surgery. And I got a huge download that I was being asked to change my focus and change my work and change a lot of things about myself if I wanted to stay. And I think we do get those messages often when we hit a diagnosis, if it's not a hard exit, we'll start getting the intuitive knowledge that, gee, I'm being asked to change something. What is it? What is the lesson in this? And so for me, what I came to was I needed to bring in different kinds of ideas and and as a result for example i'm teaching an angelic ministry class trying to help everybody step up to their angelic selves Mm -hmm. and you know that never came to me until this diagnosis so i was doing all that and then i went into surgery and the surgeon beforehand i had said can you promise me that i won't have to do chemo and that it won't have spread and she said no i can't promise you that So I was all, you know, in my spiritual self trying to go into that situation. And when she came out of surgery, um, she told my husband, I, you know, I took a big chunk of her colon, but I have to send the tissue to the lab because some of it looked suspicious. Um, So Jean, my husband went to tell me that and I was like, don't tell me, I just want to be happy. You know, I'm not going to go go down there that road. And then a few days later, she called me up and said, "Um, Sue, you have had a miracle. She said, I took 25 lymph nodes out of your colon. I took a big chunk of, you know, the tumor and then extended tissue. And there is no spread anywhere. And I knew it was a miracle. She even said it was a miracle. And she said, the tumor, your body had somehow wrapped the tumor in something protective. Mm -hmm. And Allison, what I feel about that, partly it was Paul, and partly it was me choosing to stay or go, and that it could have gone either way, Mm -hmm. depending on the choices my soul was making. Your passing wasn't set in stone. You were the other side of the coin of your husband, Paul, and he didn't survive and you did. And I think that probably makes him very happy to be able to assist you in staying. And it does. (laughs) And he also said, he said to me so clearly, he said, you were traumatized by my exit. And even though you've done such good work and you've helped people, there's a part of you still carrying that trauma And he said, this is to erase it Mm -hmm. because now I've had colon cancer and it's not terrifying me anymore. It's not the boogeyman in the closet. I feel so healed and so reborn from that. And if you had told me a few years ago, hey, Sue, you're going to get colon cancer like your husband did and and it's going to heal you. I would have said, are you crazy? (laughs) We never know what we need. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> so, so with the we were talking about astrology and numerology as well, but you stick more to numerology rather yeah. than astrology. Great. Got it. Um, it's cause Tom's more astrology, but dabbles in numerology. Like we're dabblers. Right, we right. like to dabble. Right. And, um, so I was just curious, um, do you look at things going on in world events and try and see what is happening at that time? Like last October, did you see upheaval, you know, for Israel or do you see these things and and track them? You know, last spring when all of that war was really, you know, coming to the surface, yes, because I had even noticed that in uh, 2024, you know, that was going to be, that time period was a four energy. Mm -hmm. And that four, even though we want to say it's about strength and hard work and everything, it's also difficult, Mm -hmm. you know, and here we were with war happening with very, you know, a lot of hard things happening. And of course, always hard things happening in politics. And that energy of the four was saying, get to work, people, you have to learn to cooperate, you have to learn to work together, you have to learn to step up to a higher 
nature. And the four says, don't get stuck in the lower frequency of just being human and lost in the old ideas. And that was a big part of what happened in the spring. So how do you get people who have the lowest frequency energy, which we're saying like terrorists and people who are just bad people, how do you ever change their frequency when they have no desire to do so? So let me tell you about this amazing angelic ministry class. When I started it, I didn't know where it was going to go. I had never taught it before. And the angels had said, here's the outline. Where can people, where can people find that? Where they, can they find if your they, class? If they go to suefrederick.com, they'll see I have a new one coming up. I just wanted them <clears throat> to be able to pull it up while you're talking yeah. about it. Please continue. So we did a um, every week for seven weeks, we would do these um, meditations where we would lift up above the earth and we would see all the trouble spot. It was like looking at an inflamed world. I, I think of it as fever, mm -hmm. like you could feel the hot spots here, the hot spots here. And we would just pour love and light and goodness on those places with no judgment. And we would even bring it down to the seeing one person who was suffering, kind of looking up and going, oh, gosh, I suddenly feel love. I feel something better. And, you know, we all were doing it. And as a group, it was amazing. It felt so, so powerful. Collective and energy. Right. Yeah. And I feel like we can never make one person change. That's up to their free will. But if we're aware that our energy directed at the world, whether it's negative or positive, that it does have an impact. Now we're learning. Well, I think that's the ultimate question here on earth right now, Allison. I mean, you nailed it. It's yeah. like, are we going to be able to say to those people energetically, you are here to heal and help others. And maybe it's going to have to be a big ending in 2025 yeah. <laughs> to help you know, those people wake up. And right. that's why I said attachments are not going to work out for people in 2025. You when know, I was, if, when I was thinking of 2025 today, I told Joe, he's like, what have you been seeing? I'm like, I'm like fire. And he's like, you keep seeing fire. He's like, like a candle. And I said, like an inferno, like it's not yeah. good. So yeah. although well, I there's going to, there's got to be some serious war aspects that are going to happen yeah. in 2025 that are going to wake some people up who have been asleep most of their lives to the reality that we're touchable. You know, yeah. that, that there's generations that don't remember 9-11. They don't know what it's like to truly lose someone, but they'll post pictures on Instagram of, you know, their pet turtle that died. It's like, okay, you need a reality check. You need to come to the land of the living here and recognize there are people hurting and now is about not losing our humanity. Right, and we've been, exactly. we've been seeing that for years. As generations get older, we're seeing, I'm seeing less humanity coming from people because they lost religion a long time ago. Well, nine is the number of waking up to our humanity. I mean, that's when numerology in the number nine says, ah, now you're graduating to the highest lessons yeah. of being human. And that's about, we're supposed to be here with our hearts open, taking care of each other. But isn't the, is highest, the isn't the highest level of being human dying? Ah. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's not tell anybody that, Elton. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no. I think that's the ultimate moment. Oh, no. It is the graduation right there. Oh, yes. But some people may not take that right. <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, it's hard to say what's going to happen. You could look at some of the planets and what they're doing. You can look at the numbers and sort right. of get a vibe. And each of us are different sort of conduits for how we process the energy and read it. I was looking at Pluto just retrograded back into Capricorn for two months. I'm none too pleased about that. Amen. And it's government and government power trying to control. And that's what we're going to see rear its head into November. And then it finally goes securely 
into Aquarius for 15 years. Thank Jesus. Yeah, uh, woohoo, you Aquarians. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, here's the thing about Aquarius. She knows how to clean shit up, okay? Yeah, that's so right. That's she's going to sort things out and be like, yeah, you can't play in my yard anymore because you cause problems. And you're yeah. going to see some isolationism, rebellion of the people, um, you will see humanitarianism as well, but with boundaries, like yeah. not, not doormat humanitarianism, yeah. but eyes wide open. Yeah, powerful, powerful humanitarianism. Yes. And, you know, I think part of powerful humanitarianism is realizing it has to be part of the government, too. It has to be it has to infiltrate human life on every level from top to bottom and. <laughs> You know, and so powerful humanitarianism even includes how we look at each other, talk to each other, feel about each other, and and taking the two and the 22 of 2025 and making sure that we're aware that even if you disagree with me and I disagree with you, I'm going to cooperate with you and I'm going to try to work for highest good for all. See, I see things a little more black and white. I'm going to look at you and I'm going to look at other people and be like, as long as you're not hurting anyone else or breaking the law, I can find a way to work with you. But if yeah. you're crossing my boundaries, I'm going to cross yours. And that's a Sounds queer, like a true a queer, hate pastel, it's, right there. It's a, I don't know. I don't know why God gave me this ability. Why they said this little redheaded girl with the dark eyes that is the biggest mud on the planet. Apparently, twenty percent American Indian had no idea until I had a test run, and I'm just like, this is my red hair. These are my dimples. Like. I'm odd and I've always been odd. Why would I be given this ability, but also a heart that wants to put bad guys away? And yeah. I can't separate the two. Well, that's your role here. Yeah. I mean, an eight path is perfectly in alignment to do that. I'm not an eight path and I can't You're think all that way. You know? <laughs> I, have to, I have to pray it and heal it. You keep and... praying about it. I'm going to put them away. Yes. Yeah, that's right. I'll send them to you. That's Allison. what I'm talking about, Sue. We can work in tandem. It's fine. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, tell people where they can find your class and your books, which I bought one of your um, numerology oh. workbooks oh, at the Helping Parents Heal Conference. So wow, thank you for what that. What an honor. I love, I love, I love reading it. So anybody that wants to learn numerology can pick one of those up, right? Yes, they're on Amazon and numerology. It's called Sacred Numerology by Sue Frederick. Um, and then the other thing is if they go to suefrederick.com, they'll get two benefits. And one is I have a soul path calculator for free. Nice. So Allison, any, anybody can go there and put in their date of birth and figure out what life path they're on in numerology and their personal year and all of that good stuff. And the other thing is signing up for the angelic ministry class while you're putting them away, Allison, I'm going to be bringing them light and love with the angelic ministry. Hey, we're both two ends of the spectrum. That's and right. Both are, and both are both necessary. Needed. Yes, That's absolutely. Right. You know, what would totally break your website in a good way. If you put up a numerology sort of where you could put in someone, your dating's information too, and it could tell Ooh, you if it was an absolute, yeah, and, and it could have like a, like a cartoon character of you going, no, stand back. He's bad news. This oh won't work. Oh my God, I got to do that. <laughs> I've got it. That's next on right? my agenda. Then. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like a couple's that's numerology perfect. meter of success yeah, or failure. Perfect. That would be cool. Yeah. All right. I wrote all that stuff in my book, I See Your Soulmate. But now what you're telling me is I got to make it in my calculator. And yes. that is a great idea. Yes. Well, I hope you all enjoyed hearing from Sue Frederick on what she sees in the numbers for 2024 and 2025. Now I'd like to introduce you all to Dr. Jeff O'Driscoll and his story. Today on The Dead Life, I have a very special guest. Dr. Jeff O'Driscoll joins me today to share with you his experiences in the emergency room, witnessing what happens when a person dies and how it brought him to where he is today. Dr. O'Driscoll suffered the loss of his own daughter, so I offered to bring her through for him. We'll share with you some of the audio clips from his reading last Saturday. 
and we'll find out how hearing from his daughter affected him. If you want to leave me a message that might be shared on a future episode of The Dead Life in my Love Me, Love Me Not relationship segment, leave it at 802-DEAD-811. That's 802-332-3811. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Jeff O'Driscoll to The Dead Life. Thank you for being here. Oh, it's good to be with you. Thanks for having me, Allison. Oh, anytime. Um, I'm so glad that I got to meet you. I think that my listeners are going to love hearing your story because you come from a scientific standpoint, but also a soulful standpoint, which is a nice, nice, refreshing combination to find. So can you tell the listeners a little bit about you? Yes. Um, I practiced as an emergency physician for 25 years in a major trauma center. So I saw the most severely injured and the sickest patients that were flown in from around the state and neighboring states. And uh, occasionally somebody was just too badly injured or too ill to survive. And sometimes when patients would pass, I'd see them leave their bodies and they'd communicate with me before they left. Um, it didn't happen all the time, but it happened frequently enough that it felt natural and normal for me. And uh, it was just an aspect of my practice that I never spoke about for 25 years until I stopped seeing patients. And then about six months after I stopped seeing patients in the ER, something clicked and I understood it's okay to talk about it now. So I started to share. So with the um, with you leaving uh practice what did you do after that like what path did it take you down with all the experience that you had well uh, as I said about six months after I stopped practicing it felt okay to talk about it Mm -hmm. and a few months after that I'd written my book uh, not yet which is a memoir of some of those experiences in the in the emergency department and then uh, I started to speak about it publicly and now I've spoken uh, uh pretty widely across the country and a little bit internationally as well, uh, sharing my experiences with uh, other people. So being able to cross over, if you will, into the realm of spirituality, uh, because you had maybe witnessed deaths and had that communication, it probably opened you up a little bit more to that maybe we don't have all the answers Maybe science doesn't have an answer for this. I talked to my husband about this, you know, being that he's a scientist and some things we just can't explain. But when we die, our soul is energy and that energy can communicate with the living because we're all that same energy. It's just they don't have the physical limitations that we do. And I wanted to thank you for letting me do a reading for you because when I met you, Um, I just, I had this need and I know that sounds weird and it never happens to me. I just kept hearing, you have to read him, you know, you have to read him. And so I appreciate you letting me do that because it actually released something in me where now that's done and I can feel sort of at ease about it that I did what I was asked to do. Um, we're going to share some of the clips from your reading and I'm just going to ask you to comment in your you know, however it affected you or anything about your daughter that you want to share with the listeners. So can we go ahead and play that first clip? Um, She also is holding a puppy. Did your daughter have a dog that passed that it would be important for her to be with? Because she's referencing having this puppy that feels special to her. Yes, we we only ever had one dog when she was a child. And it was hard for the kids when the dog left. Okay. So the dog is now a puppy again. It reverted to a younger age, just like she did. So if you take out a picture of the dog when it was younger, that's what it looks like with her. So she's pretty happy about that, <laughs> that they have each other. Yes, I'm sure she is. <laughs> I, I love in readings that animals come through too with them because anything that we love and lost is there waiting for us when we cross. So I love that she came through with the puppy 
um, that meant so much to your kids. Did you get to share any of the reading with your family or are you going to wait? I shared some of it with my wife um, and uh, I'll, I'll probably share some of it with other members of the family. Um, uh, just just taking it in and sitting with it and uh, and seeing how it feels. Did you get to reflect on anything that your daughter was saying in the reading um, or maybe t- took it a different way and where you feel like maybe she was, you know, meaning something else or where something made more sense to you once you uh, stewed on it? Like, how did that, how did it affect you over the weekend? There were things that uh, I thought were strikingly uh, on point. You know, uh, when she told you, she, you said she was holding a book and you asked me if I had written a book or if I was writing a book. Of course, I had written my memoir, but I don't, that's not the, what resonated when you asked me the question. I just wrote a new book and I dedicated it to Rachel. I wrote it before she got sick and I published it after she passed away and I dedicated it to her. And, and that was a, a pretty specific thing for you to mention. Well, I, um, I never know what they're talking about. Like I said, I'm just a secretary. So I'm just passing on what they're saying, knowing that it's going to mean something to you. Can we go ahead and play the book clip, Joe? She's holding up a book and she's smiling. Um, are you writing a book? Did you um, dedicate a book to her? She's referencing the book. Yeah. Yeah, I dedicated a book to her. I wrote it before she got diagnosed, and I published it just after she passed, and she actually gave me the title of the book after she passed away. Awesome. Okay. So she's acknowledging it, seeing it, loving the dedication, so that you know she's part of your world still, part of you, part of your life. Okay. Is it all right if I tell you something? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I I wrote, it's a novel, but it's about an emergency physician like myself trying to get his head around the spiritual experience he has in the ER that science can't explain. And the inciting event in the book was the sudden unexpected death of his adult daughter and her working across the veil to show him what's real and and help him understand. And it was all written before Rachel got sick. Wow. Uh, It's very prophetic. So were you taken aback when you wrote that book and then that ended up being your reality? Did that strike you as unusual or did you recognize that the other side was giving you a heads up of what was coming and you were writing it down and processing it, not thinking it was going to be an actual occurrence in your life? But at the time, you must have put yourself in the place of the, of the father in the book and what that must feel like, what your character was going through. Yes, I thought I was writing purely fiction. And the main character is an emergency physician uh, struggling to understand the experiences he has in the ER that science can't explain. And the inciting event that uh, really sends him on his journey to, of discovery is the unexpected death of his daughter, Zen. And I remember very clearly a few years ago, because I wrote the book over a couple of years, I remember when I wrote about the main character talking to his wife about their daughter's passing, and it just, from the depth of his souls, he said, God, I love that kid. And when I wrote that line, I broke down and cried. And I couldn't understand why it impacted me so deeply. I wondered about it at the time. And then I set the book aside. It was all written, all edited, ready to be published. And I set it aside when my father got ill and I cared for him for about six weeks and and he passed away. And and at his funeral, a week after his funeral, my daughter was diagnosed. And a few months later, I remembered writing that line in the book and my jaw just dropped open. And I thought, oh, my soul knew. It sounds like you were being prepared for something that was unimaginable that you would go through in your life. And it must have struck a chord when you were writing it with your soul that this hurts and that this may be a path that I become familiar with. So 
I think it's going to be interesting with you moving forward because I think you're going to see more predictions come to pass, things that you feel, things that you sense. and But just to um, alleviate any painful thought that that might give you, um, a lot of the predictions are good. <laughs> so you're actually going to find some joy in some of those predictions. Well, you know, I had a series of events with rainbows right after Rachel died. It began within minutes, actually. Mm -hmm. Just really amazing events that were hard to construe as being coincidental or accidents. And there, there's too many to talk about in this, in this show. But when I picked up the manuscript to publish it, I thought maybe I should read it once more and make sure everything's in order before I publish it. And I started reading it, and there's a chapter in the book where the main character goes into Zen's bedroom. He hasn't been in there since her funeral. And he takes a whiff of her perfume that's sitting on, on the counter. And he sits down in the middle of the floor of her bedroom and he feels her presence, which was a profoundly unusual thing for him because those kind of things didn't happen to him. Mm -hmm. But he felt her presence. And at that moment, he looked across the room and the beveled glass windows of her bedroom were casting rainbows all across the, the far wall of the bedroom. And when I read it, it just moved me to tears because I'd forgotten I, read, I wrote it. And I'd been having all these experiences with rainbows. And, and I closed the book and I heard my daughter say, Dad, you wrote your own sign. I'm just honoring it. That's so beautiful. I mean, thank you for sharing that with me because that's really special. And I think a lot of my listeners have signs that they get and they can relate to what you've been through. And... Um, you just carry such a deep love for your daughter and you've honored her in so many ways. Thank you for being here, um, Jeff, Dr. Jeff O'Driscoll, and uh, sharing your journey with us. We appreciate your time and I'm sure my listeners will be reaching out and especially the men that are out there, the dads who lose children. It's nice to have a father on that can speak to other fathers. So thank you for that as well. Um, and thank you to my listeners for tuning in. You can catch me next Tuesday for a fresh episode of The Dead Life. I'm Allison Dubois. This is The Dead Life. And to all of my believers out there, don't stop believing. Join us next week on The Dead Life. And don't forget to subscribe now to get notified of every new episode.